and you'll probably get just a little message that lets you know we're recording and asks if that's okay. Great, it is 11 o'clock and I know we'll have more people logging on, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna get started. This is being recorded. And so anything that you miss or anything you wanna go back and revisit or share with someone else uh, will be available uh, around a day following the webinar and you'll get a link to that. Uh, so we're so excited to be partnering with the Minnesota Department of Human Services today uh, to provide an introduction to early intensive developmental and behavioral intervention, uh, probably better known as EIDBI. This is part one of a two-part uh, training series on the therapeutic approaches to in intervention for individuals with autism and related conditions. Uh, so today we'll be covering an overview of the developmental approach to EIDBI, and then on December 8th, we'll be uh, covering the behavioral piece. Uh, for everyone who is not familiar, I wanted to do a very, very brief introduction to Family Voices of Minnesota. Uh, I am the outreach coordinator for Family Voices of Minnesota and uh, myself and all the other staff that works for Family Voices are all parents uh, raising children who have any type of disability or special health care need. Uh, we're the state affiliate organization of Family Voices National and also the state alliance member of Parent to Parent USA. So we provide um, our connected program for parent to parent peer support, which allows us as parents to share information, experiences, to assist one another, to support one another emotionally, uh, we have over 180 trained volunteer support parents throughout the state of Minnesota that we can match parents with for that support um, according to their needs. And oh, sorry about my slide. And then of course we offer encouragement and education to support parents in advocating and speaking up for their children. We do that through one-to-one -one peer connections through our parent groups, most of which are running virtually right now during the pandemic our resource uh, rich website where you can actually chat live with other parents and through family leadership, volunteer support parent trainings and through educational webinars like the one that um, you're attending today. Just a quick note for people who aren't familiar, the um, peer support uh, is researched and is found to be so valuable, not um, partly by parent testimony, but also just through uh, certain uh, measures. We know that one in five Minnesota families are raising a child with some type of disability or chronic health condition. And when they uh, benefit from uh, the, the best practice-based parent-to-parent programs, uh, they report increased confidence in caring for their family and child, uh, increased confidence accessing their needed community resources and navigating systems. And uh, really interestingly, but probably not surprising, uh, reported a 56% decrease in use of emergency department visits and a de decrease in missed school days. Um, so we are really happy to be working with professionals to identify families who might benefit from support. And um, we know that many professionals are just happy to learn about the program so that they can uh, provide a resource for parents that not, not that other people don't offer. Uh, and that parents um, are more relaxed and confident uh, and relieved. So these slides will go out as a PDF along with the slides for, that the presenters are going to share. And there will be some links on how to connect yourself or how you can connect families with us. I do not want to take any more time or space, so I just want to welcome our parent, our uh, panelists. Uh, Chris Worrell with Dynam is the uh, founder and executive director of Dynamic Connections. Revel Weber is the EIDBI coordinator for Empowering Kids, and Vanessa Slivkin is the 
Senior Director of Autism Services with St. David's Center. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Rebel's going to start sharing hers. So just give us one second to make that switch. Hi, everybody. I am uh, Rebel Weber, and I apologize. I'm kind of fighting a little bit of a cold. So if I'm hard to understand, just let me know. Um, and like Jamie said, I am with Empowering Kids, and I will let Vanessa and Chris introduce themselves. All right. I'm Vanessa Slivkin. Uh, really happy to be here, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I direct our autism services and our day treatment services at St. David's Center. I'm Chris Worrell. I am an, uh, I was an OT first and then I became an RDI consultant and then I founded Dynamic Connections Autism Program um, and I'm currently in the midst of that as well. All right, we uh, definitely recognize that there is there could be hours of presentation on uh, the developmental approaches, especially as we go through um, the DIR floor time model and then the RDI model um, with Chris. So just know that we're kind of skimming the surface today and hope that this is a helpful introduction and the three of us would be happy to answer questions, um, have a part to um, engage with you at any kind of level that you'd like to dive deeper into um, developmental models. Um, but to get us started, um, developmental approaches were really um, based in developmental psychology, really looking at um, where a child is um, developmentally um, up the developmental ladder will be something you'll hear us talk about and really meeting the child where they are at um, at that point in time. So not as much um, chronological age as um, developmental age and um, just really emphasizes the importance of engagement, um, having emotionally meaningful interactions between an adult and a child, a child and a child, um, just really that those um, interactions are emotionally meaningful, um, really emphasizes relationships, uh, emphasizes regulation, um, and it's child-led and adult-supported. And that is something that can be a bit confusing. Um, so I just wanna go into that a little bit. Um, the, I think there's many standards of therapy and, and education that are based on adult-led experiences um, where the adult is showing or telling the child what to do. I think that's you know, really where, how, um, how we grew up um, was listening to an adult and doing what an adult says. Um, Unfortunately, um, what developmentalists have found um, is that this can lead to some resistance um, on the child's part, um, dependence on being shown um, what to do or told answers to problems, and then just really being reliant on that process. That can happen. Um, and I think too often we give children um, solutions to remember um, versus problems um, versus problems to solve. So helping them really with problem solving. Um, and I really like um, Jay Greenspan gives the example for this of similar to a math teacher telling their student two plus two equals four. So now they've learned um, that answer. So that's great, um, but they don't know how to add. Um, so again, that's really, they have memorized this um, answer to a problem, but don't actually know how to solve the problem. I just think that's a nice, um, real simplistic way to um, illustrate that. Um, in context learning, so um, everything is meant to be um, implemented naturally in natural interactions. Um, and kind of again, going with the um, trying to stimulate that um, problem solving uh, encourages and motivates thinking and learning and really spontaneous thought. So we're not wanting a child to um, learn because we want them to or because um, we told them to, we want them to be motivated. Um, to think and to learn and excited about that. Um, and really we feel like um, if our first learning is primarily adult led, it can be difficult um, for kids to, to problem solve new situations and think independently. But if our first learnings, if you think about going back to what you've learned um, throughout your life, 
if they're based on, you know, trying to figure out the answer with the right support. So we're not saying like, you just do, do you and we'll be standing over here. We're gonna help support you at whatever level um, you need. But then problem solving becomes more fun. Um, it might become easier and you, you know, we think can learn a lot more from the environment. And then once problem solving that skill becomes more firmly developed, we feel like um, then we can kind of impose more of the adult led teaching. Um, and then just want to um, highlight that parent involvement is essential. So talking about kids, you know, feel like um, you need your your family and your your adults around you. Um, so in our developmental models, parents parent involvement in the sessions and then carrying on that into um, the rest of the world is is really essential. Um, Chris, would you like to add anything? I just wanted to add in the developmental, uh, when, we're, when we think about where they are developmentally, another piece of that is that there can be very uneven development. And so they may be talking like this at this level and then their emotional processes, processing might be at a different level. And even within that emotional or language or whatever track we're on, there can be a couple of holes back, back a ways. So again, that's part of the, the skilled part of it is finding those holes and, and figuring out how to help the, them grow and, and develop those skills. So I am gonna start us off with just giving a really brief history overview of DIR floor time along with Vanessa. Um, one of the things, so, Floor Time was created by Dr. Stanley Greenspan and Dr. Serena Weeder back in like the late 1980s. Um, so it's been around for a long time um, and has been used and has developed since then. Um, and Dr. Weeder and um, Dr. Greenspan actually created Floor Time out of their work in infant and early childhood mental health. They were pioneers in the DC 0 to 5, um, and well, it was DC 0 to 3 back then. Um, and from their work together in that, they created DIR for time. Um, there are three agencies that currently work with certification and training of DIR for time providers. So you might notice some differences between how Vanessa and I speak about floor time because my training is through the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning, and Vanessa's is through the Greenspan floor time, Greenspan floor time approach. And there's also a third one called Perfecta. Um, so while some of the things that we might say are worded a little bit different, the concepts and the theory behind everything is the same. Um, one of the things that Dr. Greenspan always said was that DIR is the theory and floor time is how we put the theory into practice. So we are going to talk a little bit more about what the theory is. Vanessa, do you have anything to add? Um, I just saw uh, in the chat, someone had asked, Kaylee had asked about what does DC zero to three and DC zero to five stand for? Um, that's a great question. Anytime we sling um, acronyms around, feel free to, to ask and we will try to uh, make sure that we're speaking um, human language as well. Um, Rebel, I don't know if you wanna talk about that or I can just say it's the, um, if you've heard, um, so in giving mental health diagnoses to um, individuals, there is the um, diagnostic manual for doing that. Um, and then the, um, that was kind of for everyone. Um, but then there's the, there's the manuals that go for um, like young kids and understanding that there are so many um, factors that are different in diagnosing children than diagnosing um, adults. Yep, exactly. Similar to the DSM. Um, it's just for, um, so the zero to three is zero to three year olds and zero, and then it expanded to zero to five. So just um, different diagnoses, different codes. Um, yep, and just looking at um, looking at diagnosing different for kids than the rest of the population. Yeah. So it was just Dr. Greenspan and Dr. Weeder were a part of creating those diagnostic classifications for those early childhood. So they really were focusing on early childhood development, especially that social emotional piece of things. And out of that work came DIR for time. Um, so. The D and DIR stands for development. Um, so kind of like we were saying before, this is a developmental approach. Our first and foremost is that we understand where the child is at developmentally. Like Chris said, they can be 
Um, they can have really strong skills in certain developmental areas and struggles in others. So our role as DIR floor time providers and anybody really with a developmental lens is to always be considering what, where the child is at and where we want them to go. What do we need to support them in and what strengths can we use to help them go up the developmental ladder? Um, in floor time, we have nine developmental capacities um, and I won't go through all of them. Um, but just know that they are like they, the base one is regulation all the way up into gray area and reflective thinking and um, to, like the growth of sense of self. Um, so it goes from like regulation and attention all the way up to that. Um, the I in DIR is for individual differences. That's really pretty much everything that makes the child a unique human being. Um, their sensory systems, their motor systems, um, relationship interactions. So oftentimes, um, one of the things that I really like to emphasize in the R um, in my clinic is that the I can, like trauma can be an I. It's an individual difference that impacts how they engage and relate with the world and it impacts their development. Um, so it's really anything that kind of makes a child unique, their relationship patterns, their developmental um, um, lens and those types of things. And then the R is for relationship. And um, one of the things that I heard early on in my DIR journey was that the relationship drives the bus. We don't go anywhere without relationship. Um, we can know where they, we can know everything about their individual differences and we can know everything about their development. But if we have no relationship with them, we can't support them and we can't help them to grow. Um, so relationship is very, very important in all development, developmental models, I feel. Um, and in DIR floor time, it is part of the theory that lies behind um, our floor time practice. And that the first thing that we do with a child is we work to develop that relationship. Um, and we work to develop that relationship while we're understanding where they're at developmentally, meeting the child where they're at, following their lead, um, and understanding their individual differences. So we're setting up the environment so that it's um, a safe space for them. Um, you know, if they have sensory differences, we're making sure that the lights are too bright or that they have access to the things that will help calm them. Um, our goal is to really create that safe space for them. And then all of these things work together to help them grow, to help the child grow and to learn. Okay, this is my, maybe one of my favorite slides ever. Um, we use this so much at St. David Center. Um, and I think, sorry, there's a comment coming through. Um, so when we look at, um, there's, when we look at kind of what is a day in the life look at, a day in the life of a, a child in a developmental service look like, um, I think this, this can answer that really well um, and kind of go with what Revel was talking about too. So you can see um, the D, the I and the R that Revel was just talking about. Um, when we think about regulation, we're gonna look at the roots of the tree and we're doing this every day. Um, so when a child comes to us, we wanna know, um, you know what happened before they got here, when we're, um, how are they coming to us? Um, are they regulated? And regulation can look like um, sensory modulation, um, the motor planning and sequencing. Um, that one, I think we see a lot in just the, um, I think we take uh, neurotypical uh, brains take for, can take for granted that um, to say hello to somebody, you just walk across the room or look at that person, extend your hand um, or wave. Uh, and you don't have to do a lot of thinking about that. That really comes naturally. Um, a lot of the kids that, that we work with are um, individuals with neurodiverse brains. They, a lot of times will have to break, break all of these skills down and say, you know, and maybe not this literally, but I need to put one foot in front of the other to get over to this person. I need to lift my hand. I need to move my hand back and forth. I need to, you know, look somewhere in their direction so they know that I'm um, talking with them or, or um, um, attempting to interact with them. Um, I need to use words that um, they understand or some sort of other gesture. And I just think that one's a powerful one to think about all the steps that go into everything that we do every day um, and making sure that um, we take into consideration that that doesn't just come naturally to everyone. 
Um, there's also uh, visual processing, auditory processing, and then um, I think what a lot of a lot of the um, outward um, symptoms are in the emotional modulation. So all of these um, regulatory systems and regulatory challenges um, can be going on, and you might see a child or um, a, a child or an individual fall to the ground, cover their ears, kick and scream, um, and it's really, we're looking at the entire um, regulatory system and trying to help support them. So really the roots need to be, need to be um, well, uh, well cared for in order for the tree to grow. Um, and then going up the developmental ladder, these are what um, Revel had talked about. So um, shared attention that um, I, what you're looking at and attending to, I'm also looking at and attending to. Um, engagement, a lot of times that can be thought of as the, um, the twinkle in the eye and um, that now it's not just about um, that I enjoy bubbles and you're blowing them. It's now about, um, I really enjoy um, playing with bubbles with you. It's now more about um, engagement together um, to intentional, two-way communication. Um, Greenspan will call this um, circles of communication. So um, you can open a circle by saying hello and someone else can um, close that circle by saying hello back. And how many times, how are you? I'm good. What are you doing later? All of those are circles. And so throughout the day, we're looking at either verbally or non-verbally, how many times can we get um, a child to respond to a circle um, by closing that circle or opening that circle, which then moves to um, social problem solving and continuous flow. Continuous flow means we are having um, conversations, either verbally or non-verbally, that just really flow um, continually, smoothly. Um, and we're looking at being at that developmental age when um, someone can do that around 50 times um, pretty, pretty easily. Um, meaningful and symbolic communication. Um, so you're starting to um, engage in some creative play. Um, you're starting to be able to see that um, items can be, like I can pick up a banana. I was listening to Rafi with my son this morning. I can pick up a banana and pretend that it's a phone. Um, so you're starting to do both in language and in, in play and interaction, some symbolic communication. And then logical thinking in, in communication. So um, that's when um, you're starting to solve problems. Um, you're able to think more about um, what comes next um, and plan ahead. Uh, and I think one thing that we talk about with parents too um, is I think developmental models can get kind of a bad rap of um, it's just play. You're just following the child around and we'll get to a few of the, um, the strategies next. But I always like to um, really emphasize that um, absolutely not. That's not all we're doing, um, but that's absolutely where we're starting. And um, that who doesn't you know, look at their child or look at somebody that they care about and say, yeah, I want, I want you to be curious. I want you to have empathy. I want you to be creative. I want you to have high self-esteem. Um, and then for sure, um, academic skills as well. We want our kids to be able to organize, to be able to um, read and do math and succeed in school and succeed in academics. Um, and so I love this, this um, picture in that we get there by having strong roots, by having a, a sturdy tree, and then we can pick the apples and, and have all of those kind of higher level capacities and skills. So we are thinking about those always. Um, it's just, what do we need to do to get there? Um, and then, you know, we talked about the parent and adult being critical um, in this relationship. So I love the, the um, picture of the adult and the child giving the tree some TLC and then the warmth and nourishment um, of the sun. That was a lot. I'm going to ask um, Revel, do you want to add anything more from the um, ICDL perspective here? Anything that maybe feels different or not enough for you? Um, so like it all, it all goes together kind of like Vanessa was saying, like you have the roots and the trunk and the tree and all of that comes together. And one of the things that I really love about um, the developmental lens is that it all works together. 
and it isn't it isn't linear, so to speak. Like a child doesn't have to master their regulation before they can have good self esteem and engagement and all of those things. That's where that relationship relationship piece comes in, and you really become a partner for that child, and you can be a good co regulator for them so that they can experience positive engagement and um, purposeful communication and all of these types of things, even if they haven't quite mastered their regulation, so to speak. Um, and also they can help advocate for those types of things too, as we're working with them and we're working on like their social problem solving and their communication skills and their logical thinking to be able to say, hey, I need this to regulate right now and, or I'm feeling this way right now, can I have this? We don't need to master everything in this to do those types of things. We all have our strengths and our areas where we kind of need somebody to build us up. And that's where I think that relationship piece is really important. And especially in developmental models, we need, we need to be a team, we need to be a village and help these children and help our help each other out and stuff like that too. So the relationship piece is really important. And to also just to emphasize that we don't need to master all of it. Like we can we can use each other for support to continue to grow. Yeah, I, I think that's an awesome add. And um, one of the questions that we've received, is this just for early intervention? Is this just like early intervention age? Is this just for um, autism spectrum disorder? And absolutely not. And so I think kind of to, um, to go further with what Revel is saying, we wouldn't expect that once a child um, is engaged, that they're gonna be engaged for the rest of their lives. You know, they're gonna go through more develop, they have more developmental curveballs thrown at them. Like when you go to school and when you make your first friend and uh, when you have a new teacher, uh, every time something changes in your life, we're gonna need to go back and, um, and not even back, we're need, gonna need to move up and down um, the tree and say, yeah, we're gonna need to go and strengthen these skills again. We're gonna look at these skills again. Um, and sorry, when the chat comes up, I just wanted to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, so not, not just for kids. And um, really this is something that we would look at for um, all individuals of you know where are we at with our um, development. So not just for autism spectrum disorder either. Yes, um, so one of the things in Dr. Greenspan's early work, he used this with children with obviously autism spectrum disorder, but he also used it with a range of other individuals with um, developmental needs. Um, and he wrote a book called The Child with Special Needs that kind of detailed how this works with like children with Down syndrome and children with FASD and those types of things as well. Um, and it can be used anywhere from young child all the way up into adults. There are many um, developmental based providers that work with older kids and adults using the same type of model. So no, it is definitely not for just for early intervention. It can be used across the lifespan. All right, so a few fundamentals just to wrap up um, DAR floor time here. Um, the kind of four fundamental fundamentals that we look at, and there's way more that also goes into this, um, but is following a child's lead. And again, I wanna say that that does not just mean um, walking behind the child and following them wherever they go and doing whatever they want to. Um, it's really joining their world, um, I love the harness, the motivation, um, what's motivating them, what are they interested in, and helping them feel more in control of their environment and kind of what's going on um, in relationships. So creating a shared world, you're entering their world first, you're joining in their interests and their activities. Um, one thing with that is um, that I, I love that Jake Greenspan talks about is, um, I think we can get lost in like, I'm doing a puzzle with a child and we're sitting down doing the puzzle and I'm like, oh, that piece goes here. No, the piece goes here, you know, not necessarily that's how you would say it, but we can get really focused on what's the, the purpose of the activity. Um, so it's, it's not really about doing the puzzle or is it? Sometimes it is about doing the puzzle, but really if it's DIR floor time, it's not about doing the puzzle. It's about interacting with the child. The goal is the um, moving up the developmental ladder. So um, if they want to hide the puzzle pieces, for example, hide the puzzle pieces. Um, if they're kind of um, 
not super interested in this activity, find a way to get him at, um, interested in it that isn't necessarily going to be doing the puzzle. So his quote is, the goal is the interaction and the goal is the activity. The goal is the experience, not that one challenge. So the one challenge being doing the puzzle in this example. Um, we do, do a lot of like just silly things if a child is um, interested in maybe some little animal animal um, characters will make the um, animal hide and so the child has to kind of like look for it engage with us um, maybe it's going to go like in my sleeve it's going to go on my head it's going to run over then we're going to take another animal and chase it this isn't about um, how I want the play to go or that a child is um, you know necessarily learning that this is a, a cow and this is a dog it's um, that will come that will absolutely come but it's following their lead and in, in joining in whatever they're doing to then start to, number two, challenge to move up the developmental ladder, help them with social problem solving and thinking and tolerating stress and frustration. Now this thing isn't doing what I want it to do, but now we're in relationship and I'm really motivated to do this because we're doing what I wanna do. So now maybe I can make the challenge just a little bit harder. So a little, hide the animal a little bit further or a little bit higher so they can't reach it. And now they need to solve a problem. And are they gonna look to me to help them? I hope so. Um, I'm gonna help them need this relationship and, and help them solve the problems. And then expanding without taking control. So at no time are we really like, oh, you know, give me that, you're really into that. And um, this is interrupting our session. It's more of um, that they're still in control. And we're encouraging creativity, we're encouraging thinking and understanding these patterns um, in the interaction. And um, really doing that in, again, staying with the, the playful, the, the motivation and getting creative ourselves in how do we, uh, without taking control, how do we continue to encourage these skills? And I think um, a few, few strategies there, um, looking at treating every, action as purposeful and effective. So if a child, uh, we, we think we're following their lead in, in, um, in, in play and we notice that they run off or they throw something, what does that tell you? And it might not tell you anything, but it's probably telling you something. Either the challenge was too hard, um, it's confusing, it's scary. So just treating every action as communication and um, and purposeful, using your voice, using your facial expressions and actions to become the most interesting uh, thing in the world, in, in the room, in the world would be great. But um, I want you to not just love bubbles because bubbles are fun. I want you to love bubbles with me. So how do I become the most fun, exciting um, thing in the room? Um, and then let the child expand the interaction and activity whenever possible. So I think, <clears throat> I, at least in my training and um, how I, just am as a person, I think it's hard, it can be, I can get impatient and want to like, oh, you're struggling with that. Let me help you or let me, you know, solve this problem or fill in, fill in this gap or, you know, suggest that you do something a little bit differently. And we do need to do that, especially if they're getting frustrated and need more support. But um, I think sometimes we do that too quickly um, or we do that too much. So kind of um, holding back and seeing like, will they do more? Will they seek me out um, if I just wait a little bit longer? Um, Rebel, I'm not sure if you want to talk about co-regulating. Yeah, so kind of like what I was talking about a little bit before in the other slide, um, but like we're really there as like the adult support. We're there for like co-regulation and to help support with like the challenges and stuff. But for our children, like good co-regulation is a start before they can get to self-regulation. So we have to be really good at staying calm and being the co-regulator. So understanding the child's individual differences and how can I help support this child to either um, regulate after a period of dysregulation or stay regulated and engaged in this interaction with me, even if I'm challenging them. Um, so co-regulation is a really big piece and it comes back into that relationship piece again. You have to have a good relationship to be a good co-regulator. Um, so really focusing on how do I keep this child to feeling safe, calm, and attentive to me in these interactions. Like that is always at the back of my mind when I'm working with a kiddo in the developmental model. I want them to feel safe. I want them to enjoy working with me. And I wanna teach them something. 
And like Vanessa said, like sometimes it looks really different. Floor time can look different with everybody and developmental models in general. How I do floor time is gonna be different than how Vanessa does floor time. How I do floor time with one child with this profile is gonna look different than how I do floor time with this child over here who has a completely different profile. Um, Cause it's really uniquely tailored to that child and what they are needing in that moment. Um, and you can use all of these wonderful skills that Vanessa has been talking about, like following the child's lead, challenging, expanding, but always remembering that you are also there and being the co-regulator. You're the base right there. Um, so even if the child can't successfully self-regulate, we're their co-regulator. And even on days where, well, they can self-regulate yesterday. They were great yesterday. Well, today is a different day and I still might need to be a, co a good co-regulator today. And then now Chris will introduce us to RDI. Okay, I think that, I think the next slide. Sorry. Chris, you can move there it too. I gave you a remote control so you can Oh, beautiful, it. thank you. That's what that little pop-up was. So yeah, RDI stands for Relationship Development Intervention. Um, and it, again, reiterates that we are, our, our entire focus is on um, helping to develop relationships, for people to be able to relation, develop relationships more effectively. Um, it was started by Dr. Stephen Goodstein and Dr. Rochelle Sheely. Um, they're based out of Texas right now. Um, really, Goodstein looked at, there is so much research talking about what assisted or what, what made changes um, for people with ASD and spectrum and other, other neuro develop, neuro, neurologic differences, um, really looked at different studies of the neural pathways um, and just what really good parenting looked like and how can we recapit recapitulate that um, in our intervention. We, they, there's, there was plenty of, of information out there about how the parent child initial relationship um, got disrupted by the autism, probably by the neurologic differences that that child brought into the relationship. Um, and so there was all this inf information about that it, it was disrupted, but not uh, like what to do about it. And so that's what started, um, we started looking at the RDI piece. Um, mindful guiding is a, a major uh, strategy. It's a phrase that we um, use. Um, I tell my staff when I hire them and I talk to the families and parents about my goal for you is that you become a trusted guide for this child. And when Revel was just talking about the co-regulating, like the, the, the adult is that base, um, it's a safe base. It's like that's a parent's role in life. And, and as, as intervention people, we're sometimes being a surrogate in that role, or at least helping to develop it. And then obviously wanting to transfer that and to establish that for the parent at, or the family at home as well. Um, but mindful guiding is, is a broader and deeper potential for that connection. And that's what we're looking for. Um, and, and again, developing those skills um, so that the child experiences this relationship that it's safe i'm going to try new i'm going to i'm going to be assisted and guided to be regulated and then i'm going to be guided for challenges so these are again developmental models we're providing that safe support that sensory relationship that connection engagement and then we're going to move forward. We're looking forward, looking to providing challenges to them. And what, and again, like she said, there, um, it could be so many different possibilities. The challenge could simply be um, waiting for five seconds before we go forward. Uh, one, one example, I, um, when we are um, wanting to reestablish that, that connection with the adult as the guide, the safe guide is, I, I, I advise parents, uh, when your child asks you something verbally, depending on the kid and the profile and what they're needing, but some of them, um, I say, don't respond verbally, you know, wait. And then when they look to you, then you say, you know, can I have a cookie? 
and again, you were just getting that. I I, I need to uh, I need to seek out this information. It doesn't have to be all spoon fed to me. Um, and again, a kid has to be in a place where they're ready for that. Um, and we take very strong note of how close we are. We use the the proximal proximity. Um, so there's one times when we say, okay, you have to be within five feet. You have to be within three feet. You have to be like standing right next to him. You have to crouch down so your faces are there. And then he says, can I have a cookie? And then you're, he only has to like eat this far to actually see you to use that visual referencing um, to connect to um, to be to be connected to your guide. Um, again, this is the, that subtle differences uh, in, in parenting and day to day minute to minute parenting um, that we want to facilitate. I'm going to look at the next. I'm not sure how to move the slides. So could somebody move it for me? Thanks. The mission of the program is to look, work with clients um, with a wide range of ages. Again, we're uh, in some study research studies are looking at um, even siblings of children with autism. There's a higher incidence. I don't remember the exact number, but sometimes we're doing preventative work, um, saying, "Okay, you know, we're gonna we're gonna teach families these strategies. We're already working with the older child. They have another child. We're gonna implement with them. Um, all different ages. We have adults working on skills and where we are helping them to find a trusted guide." Um, even if it's not a parent anymore, there's a different role. Um, many different mastery levels, learning strengths, vulnerabilities. Um, in our activities and in our interactions, we're, we are supporting each client so they find their optimal entry point. We might do one activity with three or four clients, but this one's role is simply to take tape off, rip it, and hand it. So that's their competent role um, but they still are part of the, the team that's making, that's cutting out construction paper or drawing a picture or whatever. So each person has a competent role, an entry point, um, and that we're, we're monitoring them really closely to keep adjusting. Go ahead and switch. Move the slide. Thank you so much. When we are Again, engagement is, is, a, is a core central is core property and developmental models. Um, we are looking to be in sync with each other. We're, we're wanting to be on the same page. We're following some interests. Um, one difference in RDI is that we take a little bit more um, ownership uh, in, in choosing activities. We do a lot of, we're, we're working towards something we call apprenticeship so that the adult is again we're trying to cement that role of the the adult the parent being the the reference point the the one that is going to guide you through learning new things um and sometimes we have to you know put the dishes away and put your clothes on and um, those sorts of things but again in very small steps and and not in any sort of a forceful you have to do this right now sort of way um, the, can, we, can, we talk about constructing experiences. This is the therapeutic interactions. Um, exploration, again, we want that security connection, competence that we all feel competent. We have a competent, competent role. Um, and then we add some challenges, find some edge, edge of competence. Um, we, we use a concept called just noticeable differences. Again, this is a way you can feel like, okay, I'm being therapeutic. Um, we're in a we're in a role. We got everything going. It's all synchronized. And now I don't want to throw a big wrench into it. I don't want to put a teeny tiny wrench into it by changing one little thing. I've hit, had some clients where I even like I stand in a different place. They're on a swing, and um, and instead of standing in front of them, I stand on the side of them, and that makes them kind of go, "Whoa, what, what's going on? You changed it." Um, so helping manage those sorts of changes is good. Um, success, you know, makes that guiding relationship stronger. Um, again, I start every session no matter where i'm working which clientele I'm, I'm seeing with what has been successful either in my mind with the, with the staff who they've been working with it with that student the client um what where are we at where are we get to start with a base of competence and then move up from there um and the challenges 
well, that we provide are really important um, and they really add to co the complexity that's going forward. All right, and then we really work hard to cement those memories of success. Um, dynamic intelligence is another really important concept. Um, I'll just quickly go there. Uh, static intelligence is very important in life. Obviously, we got to remember our passwords and where we parked the car and um, two plus two is four. Those are really important. Um, and then we want to take that static information and we want to apply it to dynamic situations and then be able to move it around and say, oh, yeah, I parked my car over there the other day, but then there's some construction. So now I parked in back of the building today or um, I want to drive this, I usually drive this way, but da, 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 there's bad traffic, so I'm going to go this way instead. Um, people are very dynamic. So I think what happens in a lot of situations is parents, um, uh, in order to, to get through the day and do as the best they can, they become, they, they make their interactions more static, more predictable for their child to be comfortable. And then and that's good because we need to feel comfortable and safe and calm. And then when we, we begin RDI work, we'll start looking for small, again, those just noticeable differences. The child notices it, but it doesn't freak them out. Um, they don't lose their, their regulation for it. Um, so that's part of the dynamic, the dynamic pieces. But again, that point of when we talk about making social connections with, with people, people are dynamic and that is the way we are. And in order to really have some relationship we need to assist our, our clients to become uh, deal with dynamic things um and there's a quote there but we can move on from that then i wanted to give you some very specific um suggestions and i'll try to keep moving here so we can wrap up our other stuff these are basic concepts that we, again, are applied to much of the developmental model um, for search of the RDI model. Slow down when you can. You cannot do it all day long. Choose a moment, choose a, a, an opportunity when you don't have to rush somewhere, when you don't, they don't have to get their shoes on right this second. Um, there, it's not urgent. Tune into your child, attune, watch, listen experience alongside them if they stop you know you're taking a walk this is a you know a, a typical opportunity we were walking and they stop to look at something you have choices you could say keep going come on we're in a hurry or you can say i wonder what they're looking at you can go alongside them and oh cool you might point to it you might comment on it you might this is joining this is again that engagement piece um experiencing it with your child, you might, again, depending on how much language they have, you would match their language at this moment because you're just trying to connect. You're not, you don't need to teach them how to say this in a, in a more complex way. If they, if they say anything, you, you might just look at them and say, ooh, or whatever. Um, you're not, you're just supporting and guiding. Um, notice. Notice how other people enrich your life. Um, and, and I just want you to want us all to have hope and in plans and uh, believe in that the option that your child can also have meaningful relationships. Um, there's some people who can say, oh, well, people with autism don't want to relate. I don't believe that is um, on point with the people with autism that I have interacted with who become more uh, verbal and able to, to relate. But they do, in fact, want to have connection with other people, um, but it feels overwhelming or they don't know how or it doesn't feel uh, possible. Um, I also want to help to, to remind you, remember how, remember times when you have felt really competent. Um, remember times you felt uncertain. Um, think transpose that to your child like oh my heavens it's wonderful to feel competent so that's why we're working so hard behind the scenes in our skillful ways of grabbing this and pushing that and changing the parameter of that is to to keep going with that feeling of competence um feeling supported think of a time that you were really uncertain or you really were struggling and somebody stepped in and supported you how wonderful was that 
that's what that's the role that we want you to to feel comfortable in um see those possibilities i had a family i worked with one of my first who they found a, a neighbor kid to mentor the guy the this my client in soccer and she's like oh this is so good because he's been a uh, apprentice for me as a mom, but now he's going to be an apprentice for somebody else. Um, the last one is consider consider these re really small amounts of responsibility you can transfer to your child that will help build their sense of confidence competence. And this is the examples from the the verbal. Um, if they're not used to looking for your facial expressions or your information, your you know nonverbal information. Um, that's a responsibility that we want to grow within them, because in the end, when they're an adult and they're in the world, we want them to be able to notice nonverbal. I want them to be able to check voice inflection. I have families. Um, so so we're adding just a teeny piece of responsibility when they say, can I have a cookie? And we don't say anything back. We just look at them when we, we're ready. We're there. We're available. And then when they look, that's their responsibility to seek information. Um, I don't know if there's any questions that popped up there. Um, I think that's the last slide that I have. Um, so one of the things that we would like to ask all of you, this is very, very quick, kind of very basic overview of a developmental model. And we know that there can be a ton of questions after hearing this and after you process it. So if you guys could type in the chat, um, if you are interested in having maybe potentially another training that's more in depth of an in depth overview of the developmental models, or if there's any specific topics regarding the developmental models that you guys would like to learn more about, and any date or time preferences that work best for you guys, if you could just type them in the chat, that would be awesome. And then our wonderful hosts at Family Voices are going to be providing um, Chris, Vanessa, and I with a PDF of that so that we can gather all of that data and see if we can plan um, another training if that's interest, of interest to anybody. Um, here are some brief resources that you can kind of look over for to learn more about um, floor time and RBI. And then lastly, is there any questions? One of the um, things we would have loved to include in the presentation were some video clips of, you know, what does this actually look like, especially, um, you know, doing some of the strategies. Um, I just think that is so helpful in bringing it to life and bringing it together. Um, just to, due to the time and um, confidentiality, we weren't able to pull that together today. Um, but that's something we can maybe do in, in a future one. Um, I think I'm pretty confident we could with some um, a little more leeway, but um, also those the um, websites that were on the resources. I know um, that the Greenspan, the Floor Time Center, and the Stanley Greenspan also has um, some really great brief clips to uh, and resources for families. So um, if you want to poke around on there a little bit, I think it's pretty intuitive as far as resources for parents, resources for professionals, and then some video clips of you know, kind of what does this look like. So, um, and then we'll try to have some for you as well. Gosh, thank you so much. You guys covered so much. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's even more um, I think it, I appreciate that our presenters have been answering questions as they come in, but um, I think it would be really helpful to answer them out loud for the sake of recording and so that everyone uh, can hear them. And um, so the first one was, what does DIR stand for? And I know that came in while uh, Revel was talking about it. So it's been um, answered, but I'm not sure if we wanna say out loud, just again, what the actual acronym stands for. So the acronym stands for D is for developmental, I is individual differences, and R is relationship-based. Um, so like I said, DIR is the theory. So considering development, considering individual differences, and developing and using that relationship is the theory that underlines it. And then floor time is just the word that um, Dr. Greenspan and Dr. Weeder have used to how we put the DIR theory into practice. Thank you. Um, and then we had another question that Vanessa answered. Uh, so Vanessa, I'm not sure if you wanna share out loud the can um, RDI principles transfer to the student teacher relationship? 
Mm -hmm. Yep, and my response was just absolutely. I think anytime you have um, an, a trusting adult um, partner and or trusting mentor partner um, and, uh, and the other, that's absolutely um, a way that you can do this work. And there's there uh, there's several models going on in schools already um, in different parts of the country um, where actually teachers are being certified with a teaching RDI certificate um, and are including um, principals in their classrooms. Um, and and obviously there's always small or, or you know small things that happen with each client. Like this is what we're really focusing on. Here's how you can you can carry this out in the school. Um, I'm going to ask one more from the already answered, and then I'm going to switch back and forth a little bit just in the interest of time. I just want to remind everyone, because I know people will start to log off, that uh, you will go to a super brief survey after this, if you don't mind just filling in those questions so that uh, we can grow and develop. Um, but as a follow-up to the last question as well, uh, when autism is diagnosed later, like around school age, do you still go back to the parent-child relationship? Absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 your first relationship. So all of us are, are thinking about relationship and the developmental components that help to build appropriate relationship skills. That's your first relationship. And so even if uh, we want somebody to be in that in that role. Um, and again, it's not going back there to blame. It, it's only going back to say, hey, let's fill in these gaps and let's, uh, because of the child's issues and the possibly the parent issues, it might not have been uh, productive at that time, but we can help by tweaking some things. Thank you. And we went on to get clarification that DIR floor time and RDI are something that can be implemented at any age. Um, we have a question about how this is different than applied behavior analysis ABA. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I know that the the part two of this uh, presentation I, I don't recall the date, um, but is about the ABA or behavioral interventions. So I think that will be really helpful in hearing kind of how you're thinking about. Okay, so this is what's done in a developmental approach. I think a lot of it is. Um, it's so provider specific that your um, the way that you implement your oh thanks um, the way that you implement your any therapy is going to be really based on um, who you are as a, a person and a, a therapist and I think just um, so ABA was uh, this isn't isn't my presentation to give but was um, really birthed out of um, behaviorism and um, and really looking at behavior as communication and um, motivating or changing behavior to um, to kind of help the child learn different skills and and um, so that's I think that's a, a big difference it's, is focusing a lot on behavior and, and shaping that and changing that. Um, there's different theories that there's different theories behind it. So we're a developmental based developmental theory. DIR in specifically for floor time is the theory that implement that is based under that ABA behavioral theory is what informs their practice. I, I think that there's there can be what what we the, the general mode of, of problem solving that us as we as clinicians use is some we see a maladaptive behavior or something that's not really working for that client. And then we dig back, we, we backpedal, like, okay, why is that a problem? We look back towards development as um, what's missing in their developmental profile or their developmental skills. Whereas in an ABA model, and again, none of us are trained in that. So it appears that there's a lot of work on the reinforcements, um, what, will rein, what will increase this behavior, what will decrease this behavior, but there isn't necessarily that backpedaling to the developmental pieces. I'm sure there is at times, though. So that's just a my impression. Um, I was trained in it years ago, and I've heard that it's very um, changed a lot and based on provider. So um, I think the next presentation will be super helpful. Sorry, Jamie. 
No, not at all. I, I'm going to ask one more question and then um, I'll connect with the presenters afterwards for any that possibly didn't get answered uh, just for the sake of time. But I'll do a little bit of a combo here because we had someone say that they were on a waiting list and we have someone else asking how they know if their child is eligible um, for those services. So um, to the extent that you're able, if you can address those. Rebel, I think you maybe took both of those. Uh, yeah, so with depends on like what services you're thinking that your child would be eligible for. If you're looking for the early intensive developmental and behavioral intervention services that are specific to Minnesota, finding a comprehensive multidisciplinary evaluation provider that can do the assessment to see if the child is um, eligible would be your first step. If it's just floor time or RDI, um, Connecting, I don't know about RDI specifically, but I know that ICDL um, has the DIR floor time directory and you can connect with a variety of floor time therapists on there um, that come from many different backgrounds and they have different um, requirements for the kiddos that they take on in their caseload. Yeah, I think that the, do they need it more intensive when when we first started with the EIDBI, there's a there was a sense that there wasn't enough services for clients for people with ASD and related conditions. And so we really were encouraging to try to get more intensive services if they're not doing well in a school situation. <clears throat> they're not hitting their potentials. They're not meeting uh, progressing as much as, you, as a parent feels that they might. Those are all good referral reasons. And, and similar to ICDL, there's a RDI website that lists all the providers. I'm the only one in Minnesota right now <laughs> for RDI. As far as I know, I haven't looked lately. Okay, thank you. Thank all of you. And I, I know that uh, we discussed this going in. There uh, is probably not enough time, but I really appreciate you concentrating this information and also spending your time and energy sharing today and preparing ahead of time. Uh, this is very valuable. So um, with that, I think we'll um, make sure that we're ending almost on time. And I put this in the chat, but remember to respond to the survey that pops up at the um, when you exit Zoom. And then I'll send a follow-up email with a PDF of slides, a recording link, and a registration link for part two, and any other uh, resource links that aren't on the slides that Vanessa and Chris and Revel would like me to share with you. Thank you everyone so much. Yeah, we can make sure to respond to the questions we didn't get to on there as well. So sorry Great. we ran out of time. Thanks everyone.